O oh my Lord, make me brave, 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 and make my past easy for me, easy for me. Our feet step onto the cloud of Islam, and you will discover the light of Iman. Proclaim this message entrusted to you, and the cloud of Islam will carry you. Crucifixion or crucifixion? Crucifixion or crucifixion? You see, what is it? It is repeating the same word. How can it be? Or this. This fiction is something else from the FIXION fiction. This crucifixion is a fiction. That it didn't happen. That it didn't happen. That it didn't happen. The way the Christians claim, those things didn't happen. They haven't got a word in their language. A person going on the cross and going through the ordeal and not dying. Would you say he was crucified? No. What happened on the cross? There is no word in the English language. For that, they're making a mockery of me. I said, I'll supply you the word. I said, what it is? It is not crucifixion in inverted commas. It is crucifixion. These are fictions taking place. These are fairy tales. Zan! Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and the blessings of Allah upon all of you. Brothers and sisters in Islam, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you one and all here tonight to the lecture by Mr. Ahmad Dida on the topic crucifixion, X-I-O-N, or crucifixion. C-T-I-O-N. We leave the judgment to you after Mr. Didat has delivered his lecture. Mr. Ahmad Didat, at this day and age, needs no introduction. We all know he's from Durban. It's borne out by the fact that he doesn't speak Afrikaans. He's a banana boy. He has just returned from an extensive Arab country tour lecturing on these very topics. We are indeed fortunate to have such a man in our midst and such a man who is so willing to answer our call when he came from his extensive tour. I am sure you didn't come to listen to me, so I want to ask Mr. Ahmad Dida to take the floor. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل جاء الحق وزهق الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوقا وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين ولا يزيد الظالمين إلا خسارة صدق الله صدق الله مرنا زين Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters on the subject of the crucifixion the Muslim is told in no uncertain terms in the Holy Quran the last and final revelation of God he is told in chapter 4 verse 157 وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا that they didn't kill him and they did not crucify him. Walakin lahum, But it was made to appear to them so. That is what they thought they had done, the Jews. And those who dispute therein are full of doubts. They have no certain knowledge. Illa tibazan. They only following conjecture, guesswork, fiction. For a surety, they killed him not. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, could anyone have been more explicit, more dogmatic, more uncompromising? 
in rejecting the dogma of a faith than this? The answer is impossible. The only one who could afford to do such thing would be the almighty, omnipotent, omniscient Lord of the universe. He is the only one who is entitled to speak in such terms. Illatibazan. They only follow conjecture, guesswork, fiction. The Muslim believes in this authoritative statement of the Holy Quran as a call from Allah Baritala himself. Hence, he asks no questions and he seeks for no proof. He says, my Lord said, this is what my Lord says, Amanna Saddakna, we hear and we affirm. To this Muslim attitude, the Christian retorts that we do not accept your book, the Holy Quran, as of God, and as such it holds no authority for us. And they further reason that how can a man a thousand miles away from the scene of the happenings of the alleged crucifixion and 600 years away in time tell us what happened in Jerusalem some 600 years before. He say that this is from God, the omnipotent, omniscient, the all-knowing, he knows and he has revealed this knowledge to his messenger Muhammad. Christian says, had we believed in these statements of the Quran as of God, then there would have been no problem. We would all have been Muslims. And that is actually what would have happened. If they believed that this is Allah's Kalam, they would be all Muslims. They say, further claim, that we have written records in our scriptures of eyewitnesses and your witnesses to the happenings in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, if the Christian reacts against the Muslim attitude, if he reacts strongly, we can understand. Because his salvation depends upon this belief. To him, this is the most important thing of his religion. As Saint Paul, the self-appointed 13th apostle, the self-appointed 13th apostle of Jesus Christ, as he claims in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 14, he says, If Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. In other words, you've got nothing. He's telling his Christian, fellow Christians, he said, look, if this had not happened, Christ coming back from the dead, then all of Christianity is worthless, worthless. The Americans would say garbage, it's all garbage, nothing, you haven't got a thing. The only thing you have is, he's telling, Paul is telling the Christians, is the death and resurrection of Jesus. If that is not there, you haven't got a thing to tell anybody else. And you know the truth of the statement. Because no Christian comes and tells us that we will teach you hygiene. I'm talking about personal hygiene. We are the most hygienic people. No Christian will come and tell you that we will teach you hospitality. We are the most hospitable people. No Christian can come and tell you that we will teach you ethics or morality. Though we have our little shortcomings, but in South Africa, we can boast that the Muslim, he has the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. He has the lowest gambling rate in the country. He has the lowest prison rate in the country. He has the lowest suicide rate in the country. He has the lowest divorce rate in the country. And he has the highest charity rate in the country. There is not another religious group in this country who can show a candle to us that we are better than you. There isn't. The only thing the Christian can tell us is that you have no salvation. There is no Jannah for you. There is no heaven for you. Because all your good deeds, he says, are like filthy rags, rubbish. All your good deeds, your salat, your zakat, your hajj, your saum, all these are like filthy rags. And he quotes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 6. Filthy rags. 
they count for nothing. Salvation only comes through the blood of the Lord Jesus. Now the title of this evening's talk, as well as the booklet on the subject that has been given to you, crucifixion or crucifixion. See, while one utters the words, it's hard for you to catch the joke between fiction, F-I-X, are you in crucifixion, and F-I-C-T, are you in fiction? See, it sounds the same. When the speaker is speaking, crucifixion or crucifixion. You see, what is it? It is repeating the same word, how can it be? Or this. But when you see it in front of your eyes and you see, this fiction is something else from the F-I-X, are you in fiction? The title might seem to some of our brethren somewhat a little provocative. But let me assure you, my brethren, that these words are borrowed words. I have borrowed it from the Christian's own toolbox. These are not my words. I didn't create them. You see, the American Christians, the hot gospelers, the Bible thumpers, the crusaders, fellows like Garner Ted Armstrong, the executive vice president of the Plain Truth, a magazine, which is boasting today six million copies a month, free distribution, six million a month. This Garner Ted Armstrong, he attempts to answer his own puzzle under the heading, was the resurrection a hoax? Hoax. Not my words, his words. Is it a hoax? He's asking the question. Is it a hoax? And he elucidates his poser, hoax, with the words. The resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth is either the supreme fact of history or a flagrant, deliberate fabrication. The strong words, not my words. This is how the Americans talk. These are flagrant, deliberate fabrication. Another budding young Billy Graham from America, a certain Josh McDowell of the Campus Crusade, he effuses in his book the resurrection factor, saying, I was forced to the conclusion, that is after 1,000 hours of specialized study on the subject of crucifixion, he said, I was forced to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is either, again, they always keep on using the word either. The first fellow said either, this or that, either. One of the most wicked, heartless, wishes hoaxes. Look, not my words. These are not my words. This is how they talk, the Americans. This is high pressure religious salesmanship. Superlatives of the highest order. They know how to use them. He says, since it is not possible, I say, for an Oriental like me, an Eastern like me, to emulate the superlatives of our Western brethren, we have to borrow the words and we use them in meetings, titles like this, we just had a meeting in, uh, in December last year, a debate between myself and a member of the Church of Christ. Great debate, Christ crucified, hoax or history. They are the word, hoax or history. And we went on to prove that it was a hoax. Last month, that is March 84, this same plain truth, the father of Ted Garner Armstrong, his father, Herbert Armstrong, he says, the resurrection, fact or fable. We are, these are not our titles. We don't use words like that. It is they say, is it a fact or is it a fable? I say fact or fiction. Am I going too far out? He says, he's asking the question, fact or fable? So I said, look into the fable, I say fact or fiction. That is all. So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, do you sense any tenseness or electrification in the atmosphere? People seem to be too tight. You know, I can see my brothers and sisters a bit too tight, you know, as if they are, they are spellbound, uh, mesmerized. I want you to relax a little, please. And please relax. 
And uh, to do that, look, if I may sidetrack a little, I have the print Iran, did you give it to me? Oh, I had an idea. You haven't got it. What have you got with you? Now give it to me. <laughs> give it to me. I want to make you people feel a little bit at ease. I want to offer this print Iran to anybody here. Anybody who can give me the source of this quotation, this statement I'm going to make now, whether it was Moses, the Holy Prophet Moses, Marx, Karl Marx, or Muhammad, who uttered these words? Relax, relax. I'm quoting. For those my enemies who would not that I should reign over them, rule them, bring them hither, bring them here, and slay them before me, kill them in front of my eyes. The first person who gives me the author of that statement gets this. Moses, Marx, or Muhammad. Put up your hand, put up your hand. Come on, put up your hand, 20 rands. Anybody, Moses, Marx, or Muhammad. Come on, come on, please, man. Look, these 20 runs are going. I don't want to put them back in my pocket. They're itching. My Christian brethren. Yes. Uh, the brother wants me to repeat it. I said, this quotation, where does it originate? I was asking Moses, Marx, or Muhammad. Quotation is, for those my enemies, you know my enemies, my enemies, who would not that I should reign, rule them, I want to rule them, I want to rule you all, I want to be the king, dictator of you all, and if you don't want that, I'm telling my followers here, my disciples, look, bring them here and kill them, slay them before me, who said that, Moses, Marx or Muhammad, who said that? Come on, one more, one more try. You can have them. Jesus Christ. See, people don't know their own Bible. Luke chapter 19, verse 27. Jesus Christ said, for those my enemies, who would not that I should reign them, rule them, bring them here in front of me and kill them, slay them before me. Jesus Christ. Did you say Jesus? Did anybody hear him say Jesus? Sally, Sally, that brother. Are you a Christian? He has. He knows his Bible. He deserves 20 rand. Give it to him. Right, I think it's a little better now. See, we agree with me. We are a little more relaxed now. Me too. See, those 20 runs were itching. <laughs> this was Jesus Christ on his way to the triumphant royal entry of Jerusalem, the Easter weekend when he's supposed to have been crucified. He's marching on to Jerusalem, and this is the statement he's making on the way. And on the way, his followers, people, they're flocking around him and they're marching with him and they're saying, kingdom of God will be established any minute. Riding a donkey to fulfill prophecy, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, he said, tell ye the daughters of Zion, behold thy king cometh, your king is coming, sitting upon an ass in a donkey. And a great multitude spread their garments and branches in the way. And the multitude cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And hooray, hooray to the son of David. Hosanna to the king of Israel. Hosanna in the highest. Hooray, hooray, hooray. Matthew chapter 27, verses 5 and 9. And the beloved physician, Luke, he says, Because he was near to Jerusalem, 
And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Luke chapter 19 verse 11. Immediately there was a turmoil in the air. There was electrification in the air. Jesus Christ was marching on to Jerusalem, to the temple of Jerusalem. And they were making a big noise. They were throwing flowers in his way. They were throwing palm leaves in his way. Hosanna, hooray, Hosanna, hooray. And the priests, the Jewish priests, they pleaded with Jesus. He said, look, subdue your disciples. Subdue them. You know, things might go out of hand. The Romans are ruling us. Any minute they can find an excuse for killing us, our people. Subdue them. So Jesus says, if these were to be quietened, he says, even the stones will cry. You can't subdue these people. Can't you see the spirit? If they are subdued, the stones will cry out. And he marches in, into the temple. And he upsets the money changers tables. He takes a whip and he starts whipping the people. He says, you're making the house of God into a den of thieves. Shh. The kingdom of God was almost to be established. But the whole thing went off like a damp squib. Failed. All the Hosannas, worthless. All the Hurrays, useless. Now, you see, there is a reward for success. Similarly, there is a price you have to pay for failure. The kingdom of God, rule of God Almighty on earth was to be established any minute, immediately. And the priest started crying. He said, the whole, the, all the people are going mad after him. Damn squip. The thing was a failure. It didn't work. So now we reach that upper room in Jerusalem where they're supposed to have had the last supper. While having the supper, he knew that this guy Judas Iscariot was in league with the temple authorities. He was going to betray. So Jesus tells him, go and get going with, do what you have planned to do, get it over with. And he tells his disciples, he says, you remember previously, I sent you out on your mission of preaching and healing. And when I sent you, I told you, when I sent you without purse, no extra purse, and script and shoes, lacked you anything? Did you lack anything? He says, no. They said nothing. Then said he unto them, but now, but now, he that had no purse, let him take it, and likewise his bag, and he that had no sword, sword, the one to cut people's throats, chop off people's necks. Sword, S-W-O-R-D, sword. Those who have no sword, let him sell his garments and buy one. Luke chapter 22, verses 35 and 36.